Hello, my name is John Field. I'm from the Natural Resource Ecology Laboratory at Colorado State University, and my co-author is Dr. Trung Nguyen. And today I'm going to be presenting on opportunities for sustainable intensification of agricultural land use for the production of biofuels and bioenergy, and how this might compare to natural climate solutions. Anyone that has familiarity with the state of the biofuel industry at present knows that the industry has had trouble scaling up and has had trouble meeting the mandates in the U.S. Renewable Fuel Standard to produce large quantities of cellulosic biofuels from non-food crops. There are a variety of reasons why the industry has stumbled, including low oil prices, cheap gasoline, and a variety of technology hurdles. Uh, but despite this, uh, these difficulties, there's ongoing interest in biofuels and bio-based systems for two main reasons. The first being the potential to decarbonize sectors of the energy economy that are hard to electrify. Things like aviation, shipping, high temperature heat production for various industries, and things where uh, electrification and renewable electricity from wind and solar are not necessarily going to solve the carbon problem in the short term. The other high profile area right now is negative emissions or carbon dioxide removal. And you may have heard the term bioenergy with carbon capture and storage, or BECS, and this is simply the idea that any byproduct CO2 stream from a biofuel production system or any bio-based system, if that CO2 is captured and put into underground geological storage, that represents net movement of carbon from the atmosphere through a feedstock crop and into permanent sequestration. There are very large amounts of BECs uh, of various types that are assumed in our climate stabilization and climate modeling scenarios that are consistent with the Paris Agreement targets. And one technology uh, that I'd like to highlight briefly here is carbon negative biofuel production. Because uh, biofuel uh, fermentation from first generation feedstocks such as corn produces a very pure stream of CO2 as a byproduct, that may be one of the least cost ways to deploy BECS at scale. And so here's an example of that that's currently operating in Decatur, Illinois, that has sequestered in excess of 5 million metric tons of CO2 to date over the last several years. BEX is just one of a range of possible negative emissions technologies that are all currently being pursued in parallel right now. These options range from so-called natural climate solutions, interventions like afforestation, reforestation, uh, carbon soil sequestration in agricultural systems, and all the way through higher technology options such as biochar and BECS, all the way through direct air capture. And anyone who's studying these technologies recognizes that these on the left all require large amounts of land and thus may be in competition with one another. And currently, there's a lot of thinking that to the extent that we have land availability, a land available for these negative emissions technologies, the environmental co-benefits and the biodiversity impacts of the natural climate solutions like afforestation and reforestation might be greater than for Bex. And many authors are recommending a, a pivot or a uh, reallocation of resources away from the bio-based systems towards the natural solutions. The following work that I'm going to present uh, includes two case studies where we tried to look at this, this um, bio-based systems versus natural climate solution trade-off uh, in two specific contexts. The first is in the context of working agricultural lands 
looking at agricultural residue collection as a potential feedstock for biofuel production systems. Specifically, we were looking at corn stover, which is the non-edible part of the corn plant that's left over after harvest of the corn grain. And there's been a lot of interest in collecting this biomass material and converting it to cellulosic biofuels or other bio-based products. However, there's been a lot of controversy there because this material, when left on the field and plowed into the soil ahead of the next crop, contributes to soil organic matter maintenance and storage of uh, soil carbon, uh, it's been suggested that the, the soil carbon value of that material might be higher when left in place than the fossil fuel displacement value when that material is harvested and converted to cellulosic biofuels. And so this study from 2014 was a high profile example of that type of argument. We recently completed a case study looking at this trade-off uh, in the context of a specific system in Iowa, but going into a little bit greater detail on the crop management dimension of this problem. Specifically, we were looking at background trends in intensification, so additional uh, nitrogen fertilizer application trends over time, and increasing yield trends over time in corn system, as well as uh, historic reductions in tillage intensity. And then we also looked at corn stover collection uh, as a complement to other best management practices such as winter cover crop adoption and uh, tillage, tens tillage intensity reduction. This case study was conducted uh, with partners at Argonne National Lab and we used the Descent ecosystem model, which was developed and is maintained here at Colorado State University, in order to study corn-soy uh, rotations in a case study landscape for a watershed in northwestern Iowa. For this assessment, we looked at, as I mentioned, stover collection for cellulosic ethanol production, and natural climate solutions in the context of tillage intensity reduction and rye cover cropping. And we looked at these two cases both on their own and in conjunction with one another. What we found as we did our descent modeling is that when accounting for historic increases in nitrogen fertilizer application and uh, after calibrating the descent model, to represent observed historic increases in corn yields, we find that the base or business as usual scenario of continued corn soy rotation within this case study landscape is likely associated with a strong steady increase in soil organic carbon levels. As we've intensified these systems and gotten higher yields of corn grain. This has resulted in greater root biomass and greater above ground biomass, all available to be fixed as, uh, eventually fixed as soil organic matter. Uh, from there, from that business as usual scenario, we looked at a variety of different uh, uh, combinations of stover collection for bioenergy and then adoption of natural climate solutions. We took the soil carbon outcomes from that modeling and combined them with full life cycle greenhouse gas accounting. And the results of that are shown here. On the x-axis, we're looking at soil greenhouse gas mitigation or changes in soil carbon storage under these different scenarios. And then on the y-axis, non-soil greenhouse gas displacement net greenhouse gas displacement associated with cellulosic ethanol production and then the displacement of conventional gasoline with that renewable cellulosic biofuel. Our natural climate solution scenarios are shown here and these all achieve different levels of increased soil carbon sequestration 
uh, as illustrated on the x-axis here. We did some economic modeling as well, and we found that these are uh, neutral to a uh, additional expense for farmers to implement right now in the absence of carbon trading schemes or other incentives. When looking at different scenarios with a stover collection for, for bioenergy component, we find that these scenarios illustrated here have a very significant greenhouse gas displacement value associated with the cellulosic ethanol displacing conventional gasoline. Uh, depending on whether or not natural solutions are adopted in parallel, they might result in relative reductions in soil carbon sequestration all the way up to relative uh, increases in soil carbon sequestration relative to business as usual scenario. And we found that additional revenues associated with those stover sales likely make a positive case for these different systems. When you combine the soil greenhouse gas mitigation and the non-soil greenhouse gas displacement on this diagonal axis, total greenhouse gas mitigation is generally higher for the bioenergy cases uh, compared to the natural solutions cases. And the hybrid cases of both bioenergy and natural solutions come out the highest. Our second case study is looking at the production of cellulosic biofuels on retired agricultural land with a dedicated energy crop, switchgrass, versus reforestation and other natural climate solutions on that same land. This is a scenario that has been uh, analyzed and published in the past, but our study goes into a bit more detail in a few areas. For one, we were looking at multiple types of natural climate solution, comparing and contrasting reforestation and grassland restoration. We were using our Descent ecosystem model to precisely differentiate productivity between net primary production versus longer term changes in ecosystem uh, carbon storage or net ecosystem production after accounting for heterotrophic respiration losses. And then finally, we were looking at different types of biofuel conversion technology, everything from current day technology through future anticipated technology improvements and the addition of CCS to make carbon negative biofuels. This is a study that was recently published in PNAS uh, and specifically, we were using Descent to sw simulate switchgrass versus these natural climate solution scenarios at three case study sites across the eastern U.S. Our current day biofuel scenario is comparable to the commercial scale cellulosic biorefineries that were being built about five years ago. Our future biofuel scenario considered not only likely future improvements in conversion technology, such that you could get additional uh, biofuels produced per unit of biomass feedstock, but we also considered likely future improvements in switchgrass yields due to breeding programs. And then finally, we considered the addition of CCS, as is being done at that uh, facility in Illinois right now. And we found that in a uh, cellulosic, a future cellulosic biofuel production facility, 50% of the carbon entering the facility as feedstock is likely available as a high purity byproduct CO2 stream that can be captured and sequestered. We were doing full carbon accounting in these systems, looking at both fluxes of biogenic carbon associated with ecosystem carbon storage and then also harvest of biomass in our bar energy cases and then looking also at fluxes of fossil carbon associated with conventional fuel use. We found that our bio-based systems likely achieve significantly higher net primary production and thus achieve higher total per area mitigation as compared to the natural climate solutions. Specifically, when comparing current day biofuel production from switchgrass to grassland restoration, there's likely two to two and a half times the carbon benefit of the current day biofuels. That's likely comparable to 
reforestation, but future carbon negative biofuel systems uh, have additional avoided fossil fuel uh, uh, emissions benefits and then also additions, additional CCS benefits that likely result in four to five times the carbon mitigation value of reforestation. Thank you very much for your attention and please feel free to follow up with me with any questions you might have. Thank you.